Well, your Bibles are open to 2 Corinthians. I want you to follow along in 2 Corinthians, looking at your Bibles, um, as I read the following verses. And I want you to see if you can discern a, a, a common theme in all of these verses and these passages that I have chosen to read to you. Look at chapter 1, verse 5. We read, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, and think about these words, the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Chapter 1, verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Wow. How about chapter 2, verse 4? For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you would be sorrowful, made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. Flip over to chapter 4. Verses 8 and 9. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. This is the apostle speaking these things. Not a very glamorous road here, is it? Chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. But in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger. Where's the the health, wealth, and prosperity in Paul's life? Chapter 7, let me give you one more, verses 5 and 6. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God who comforts the depressed comforted us with the coming of Titus. And the verses along these lines continue. It's been called by John MacArthur the most personally revealing of all of Paul's epistles. Homer Kent said it's a letter that uncovers the affectionate warmth of a man while at the same time showing the anguish of heart which he often suffered. And Ken Hughes said it's the most emotional of all of Paul's writings. Nowhere is his heart so torn and exposed as in this letter. 2 Corinthians bears a fierce tone of injured love and relentless affection. As we get ready to dive into 2 Corinthians, we're going to see a God-inspired masterpiece of God-given grace that God gave to a man to tremendously love a church that persecuted him. We're going to dive into Paul's heart and experience, as we do often in our own hearts, the the, the heart-wrenching pain that this church brought upon the apostle. Their selfishness, their immaturity, their disloyalty, their rebellion, their consistent criticism, their dishonesty. And that this man did not run away, but he persisted with them through unconditional affection. You say, was Paul a masochist? Why did he stick to that? No, he wasn't a masochist. He was not immune to pain. He was no different than any of us. He was not some kind of super saint that just could deal with it. I'm sure his natural inclinations are just like ours that desires to run from pain and run from suffering. So what spurred him on? It was his love for these people. It was his love for this people that enabled him to willingly suffer, not for his own sins, but for the cause of Jesus Christ, which meant a continual dying to self. And it was dying to self for a church that was very unholy and very ungrateful. You see, it was not the lack of love for the church that caused Paul pain. We know that's the case. You can usually bear with people that you don't love and you just kind of write them off as distant from you. It was Paul's tremendous love for these people because of the love that Christ has wrought in his heart just like he has done in our hearts as well that made him more vulnerable. And the more he loved these people, the more the pain intensified because he loved them so much. Vicious attacks on his character from people in the church. 
physical beatings on his body from people outside the church. Lack of encouragement from the very people that he sought to serve. Yet he persevered because his desire was to be found faithful because his eyes were on Jesus Christ and he wished to do what God had called him to do in this regard. You see, it was his love for Christ that gave him a love for the church and a love for the church is what gave him a love for God's people within that church. But it was a love that he first received from Christ. That's what works for all of us. We receive, we're filled with the, the love of Christ as our eyes are not upon people, but upon Christ. He fills us with that love, and then we can give that sacrificial love, that untiring love to other people around us who need it. Because it's the love of God that we're passing on to others. This letter is going to teach us as to how much God loves you, his church. This letter is going to teach us that God, when we go through pain, has a purpose in the pain. This letter is going to teach us that God wants us weak. That's a a good place, in a sense, to be, because then we rest greater upon his grace and his strength than our own, right? This letter is going to teach us what it means, here you go, to have a genuine, real, real relationship with Jesus Christ, not the artificial plastic stuff that's being sold by a lot of the televangelists today, a real relationship with Christ. You say, we can learn some doctrine along the way? Yeah, we will. We'll talk about the new covenant. We'll talk about life after death and where we go. We'll talk about financial stewardship in chapters 8 and 9. We'll even talk about spiritual warfare. But the primary topic is the one that is infrequently covered in most churches, that, that less glamorous stuff that tends to invade our lives on a daily basis where we don't feel victorious. Things like, Why didn't God answer my prayer? Or why are people in the church persecuting me? Or how do I love unlovable people in the church? Or why does God permit the children that do righteousness to suffer? Or how do I persevere through these apparent never-ending trials? Or, Or how can any good come out of a situation like this? This letter is about victorious Christian living, but it it comes through suffering. Jesus went through suffering to get victory. There was a crown before there was a a cross, I should say, or a a, a crown of thorns before there was a crown of uh, glory placed upon him. And we see that in Paul's life as well. We're going to see him wrestle through some of the most emotionally painful situations that the mind can conceive. And we're going to see him emerge from that victorious in Christ. 1 Corinthians, when you read 1 Corinthians, it's got a pretty negative tone, doesn't it? But what's so ironic about this is 2 Corinthians covers all this negative material, but it emerges with a positive perspective. It's a very positive letter. It prevents Paul not as a defeated apostle, but rather an overcoming apostle, simply because of the grace of God that was evident in his life, which can also be evident in our lives as well. So here's what we're going to do today. We've got the Lord's table. We've got a lot to do. We're going to go pretty fast. Got the Lord's table set before us. But before we go to the Lord's table, I want to explain verses, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. But before I explain verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, I'd like to go to our first point in the sermon outline, which will be establishing the context of this great epistle. I normally don't do it, but I think we need to get a, get a foundation laid. I mean, we're going to be in this book now, Lord willing, for probably 50 weeks or so. Let's establish a foundation so we can understand what's going to be happening in the months ahead. All right? So let's start off with some geography. Why don't we throw the maps up on the overhead, guys? Thank you. Um, This letter was composed in roughly A.D. 56. Okay, so Jesus Christ went to the cross A.D. 33-ish, 30, 33, somewhere in that range. So it's about 20 years after the ascension of Christ. The Apostle Paul's on the scene. He ministers for 20-plus years, and the area that he is focusing on is primarily this Mediterranean region. Specifically, Corinth is right there. This is modern or uh, ancient Greece. Ancient Greece was made up of two Roman provinces. One was Macedonia. This was Macedonia. And then the lower area down here was called Achaia. So Corinth was right, and I'll get back to it, on a very strategic location uh, centered between two different ports. It's a harbor city. Um, Specifically, just to give you the big picture, here's Jerusalem down here. Antioch, that's where many of the Gentile missionary trips were sent out. 
when Paul did his trips, his first journey was down in this region. He hit Cyprus and then hit much of Asia Minor. This is modern-day Turkey. You can see a lot of the towns that are familiar to us because Paul also wrote epistles to them, right? Colossae, we have the letter to the Colossians. Uh, Over here, we have Ephesus, the letter to the Ephesians. Up in here, we have Philippi, uh, Philippi, the letter to the Philippians, Thessalonica, the letter to the Thessalonians. So these are the areas that Paul ministered to. These are a lot of the areas that are spoken of here in Revelation 2 and and 3. Uh, Crete is an island in the Mediterranean. That was the uh, place where the the ship came to rest just before the shipwreck in Acts 27. Also the same place that Titus was left when Paul wrote a letter to Titus. He was on the island of of Crete. This is northern Africa. And, of course, over here would be Rome and, and Italy as we know today. But when Paul wrote this letter, he was on his third missionary journey. As you know, it was his second missionary journey that brought him into modern-day Europe. So he's in modern-day Europe. He goes back, reports to the church how things went. They sent him on a third, which was kind of his final missionary journey in a sense. And he heads over. He's up in the Macedonian region up in here. And at this point, he writes 2 Corinthians around A.D. 56. Okay, so what's neat about this letter, too, is it's kind of choppy. It's a very emotional letter because he just is unsure about how things are going. He's going to write with a lot of sorrow and also a lot of victory as well, but he's kind of writing it along the way, and that's why it seems kind of choppy because he didn't just sit down at a desk and, 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 and breathe this letter to a scribe. He kind of wrote it as he was traveling up in this upper Greek, this Macedonian region, and again, the letter was written to a church right there uh, in, uh, in, in Corinth. Uh, you guys can turn that off, thanks. What a lot of people fail to understand uh, when it comes to Paul and his Corinthian correspondence is how many letters he wrote to this church. So let me ask you right now, how many letters did Paul write to the church in Corinth? How many of you would say one? You know I'm setting you up for this one again, don't you, huh? You're going to be scared to raise your hand. How many would say two? Come on, no one will say two? No one will say two. The last time I checked in my Bible, there was 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So I think two would be a pretty logical answer. Raise your hand if you think it's two. Okay, you guys are all wrong. It's not two. <laughs> what he wrote most likely was, at least we know, four letters to this church. First Corinthians was actually, I might confuse you on this, Second Corinthians. And Second Corinthians was actually Fourth Corinthians. You say, how do you know that? Well, you got your Bibles open. Look at First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Now, he might have written more, but he wrote at least four. We know that. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. I want you to see it again. That's why we bring our Bibles. I want you to see it in the Word of God. It's not my words that matter. It's the Word of God that matters. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. He wrote, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Okay? That was very confusing for them because basically they thought that anyone who's immoral in the world, I need to avoid them. And you basically become like a little monkey, become a cocoon. And Paul basically had to write 1 Corinthians to, re- to tell them, I didn't mean all the people in the world. I meant immoral people in the church. Don't associate with people that are repentant, unrepentant of their sins in the church. Don't associate with those people. Okay? So if he wrote that in 1 Corinthians, the obvious implication is what? That he wrote a letter before he wrote 1 Corinthians. You say, where is that first letter? Why is that not in my Bible? We don't know. For some reason, God in his providence chose not to maybe inspire it or allow it to be included in the canon of Scripture. It's lost. No one has it. No one has it. We don't know what else he said, where it is. The letter was misunderstood. So that, that prompted Paul then to write what we have now as 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, then, would have been his second letter that he wrote to the church. 1 Corinthians, you know, is just a massive rebuke. I mean, you guys are wrong here. You guys are wrong here. You guys have doctrinal problems. You guys have immoral problems. You guys are suing each other. This is, this is a joke. All right? So he blasts the church in 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians, technically, is at least 2 Corinthians. And then Paul wrote a third letter. We don't have that letter either. Where is it? We don't know. Uh, theologians call it the severe letter because he really pours it on these guys uh, because of all the problems that are happening in the church. Look at 2 Corinthians. I'll give you a couple examples of where we can uh, get some traces of this letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. There's two of them. This is one of them. Look at 2 Corinthians 2, verses 3 and 4. He writes, this is the very thing I wrote to you. So again, he's speaking of a past letter. He's not talking about 1 Corinthians. He's talking about a letter that came out after 1 Corinthians. So that when I came, so he's on his way. He's preparing them for his arrival. I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice. I want to come to you in joy. I don't want to come there and have you guys wear me down again. 
I mean, this sounds like modern churches today, doesn't it? Having confidence, you all, in, in that my joy would be the joy of you all. And he wrote, hear this, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. This is the severe letter. Sometimes it's called the painful letter. Not that you would be made sorrowful, not trying to just crush your spirits, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. The painful letter. So he writes this letter, and then he starts writing what we call 2 Corinthians in our Bible, which is actually 4 Corinthians. He starts writing this thing, and he's concerned about how they responded to this severe letter. He loved this church in Corinth. Despite his dysfunctional problems that they all had in this church, he loved these guys. And he starts writing, and he's concerned, his heart is broken, he's depressed. He's wondering, you know, it's like when you write someone a severe email or a severe letter. How are they going to, re- are they going to hate me even more because of it? Or is this going to fix the problem? So the guy's going through all kinds of emotional turmoil. He's, he calls himself depressed. Titus finally rendezvous with him around chapter 7 or so of 2 Corinthians as he's writing this letter on the move through Macedonia, and he realizes that the church responded well. So that's the tone of excitement in 2 Corinthians. Wow, you guys listened. You, you disciplined that, that, that erring individual. That's wonderful. You're doing good. I can't wait to be there. I'm looking forward to seeing you very shortly. And that would have been his third visit then to the church in, in Corinth. So in 1 Corinthians 1 to 7, you hear about kind of Paul's positive response, in a sense, to the severe letter. And then in verses 10 to 13, he kind of loads the guns and starts going after those that are still unrepentant in the church, which was now just simply the minority. It did not compose the entire church. All right, so that's a little bit of the background of what happened that led up to Paul writing this letter to the Corinthians. That's our first point. Let's go to the second point now, okay? Just an exposition of verses 1 and 2 of 2 Corinthians. Paul's introduction, verses 1 and 2, followed the um, common traditional introductions that were written of letters in antiquity. Paul follows the same three steps. You see those in your outline. First, there was the sender. Paul identifies himself as the sender. Look at verse 1. First word is Paul. He wrote the letter. I'm the sender. I'm writing to you. I'm Paul. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timothy, we know Timothy was like his beloved spiritual son. He says Timothy is our brother. Now, there's no doubt that when you study the life of Paul that he is one of the most unique and influential figures in the entire New Testament. The guy gets saved after he's persecuted the church for many years. He was killing Christians, witnessing the death of Christians. We read about that in the book of Acts as the clothes, the the coats were laid at his feet as Stephen was being stoned. But on that Damascus road, God wakes up Paul. God saves Paul. God commissions Paul to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And what what happens to Paul is this dramatic conversion where he goes from a persecutor of the church to a proclaimer of the truth. He is proclaiming the gospel. He starts sharing the good news, and the good news through Paul is going to places where the gospel had yet ever reached. And with Paul, it's just it's, it's, it's an all-or-nothing experience. I mean, he's got these incredible mountaintop experiences where he's being vaulted up to the third heavens. We'll read about that in 2 Corinthians. You know, people loving him and responding well to his teaching. And then Paul goes through these dark, dark valleys. He's pummeled by just, at times, physical suffering and emotional suffering as well. For Christ. Um, He wrote over a span of about 20 years. He wrote a total of how many letters? 13. How many letters in the New Testament? 27. So if you do the math, basically he wrote half of the New Testament. He wrote 13 letters total. He wrote nine letters to churches. Two of those letters were written to the church in Corinth. And he wrote four letters to individuals. Timothy had two. Titus had one. And Philemon had the smallest letter that he wrote. Um, Paul makes it a point in verse 1, notice this, look at your Bibles, to identify himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. We've got to kind of camp out on that term for a minute. Paul, an apostle. Why does, obviously, it's pretty important if that's the first thing he said. I'm not just a brother in the Lord. I am, Timothy's our brother, but I'm Paul and I'm an apostle. What does that mean? Well, there's two definitions oftentimes for the word apostle. Uh, the, in the lesser formal sense, the word apostle simply means one who is sent out. So again, if we were to plant a church, and uh, I see Scott right here, and uh, we send Scott to um, uh, Africa, 
uh, in a sense, we've commissioned him, we lay hands upon him, and we send out Scott to the church in Africa to represent the Grace Tabernacle, to represent Christ. In that sense, he'd be an apostle. He's an apostle. He's one that has been commissioned and sent out. In a sense, that was true for Paul. We know that he was in the church of Antioch. He and other people were commissioned. It was uh, Barnabas at that time, right? They picked up John Mark as well. Uh, They were commissioned by that church in Antioch. They were prayed over. They were fasted over, and they were sent out. So they're an apostle in kind of the small capital A sense. That's not primarily what Paul is referring to here in verse 1. He is saying that he's an apostle in the formal sense, or we could say the capital A sense. When we think of the apostle in this sense, we're thinking of who? The 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. An apostle in this sense carries the same weight and authority as Christ himself. These apostles were people who were commissioned and sent out directly by Jesus Christ. I think you know that Christ never wrote a book in the Bible. In a sense, Christ never planted a church. But what he did was he chose 12 delegates who would represent him and speak on his behalf to do his work. That's why when we read our Bibles, and I I never really get this too much from people here, but I've heard people that use this often, they'll say, well, did Jesus say that? If it's not red letters in my Bible, therefore it doesn't carry the same weight as what Paul might have said in 1 Thessalonians. And the answer is wrong because when those guys spoke, they spoke the words of Jesus Christ. They carried the weight of Jesus Christ as if Jesus Christ were speaking those words himself. That's why it says in Ephesians 2.20 that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles. See, I thought Jesus Christ was the foundation. Well, yeah. Well, then why are the apostles the foundation? Because they're the same. Christ commissioned these apostles, and the church is built upon what they've instructed us through the teaching of inspired Scripture. So Paul considered himself an apostle, and frequently it was his calling himself an apostle that gets him into all kinds of trouble. So you got the original 12 apostles that Jesus chose, right? We know that Judas fell. Number goes down to 11. You read Acts 1. They got to replace Judas. Uh, They put forth a guy named Matthias. And then Paul says this in his own words in 1 Corinthians 15. And then last of all, that means there's no more apostles in this sense. I was the last guy. I'm number 13. As to one untimely born. In other words, he came a lot later than these guys. I'm untimely born. That Jesus appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles. There's his humility. And I'm not even fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul's an apostle. The apostleship after Paul is closed. There are no more people that are coming up and speaking with the authority of Jesus Christ. When I teach you, I have no more authority than you have. The only authority I have is the authority that comes to me because I'm teaching the Word of God. When I teach the Word of God, that Word comes with authority as if an apostle or Jesus Christ is teaching. The moment I step outside of the boundaries of Scripture and start inventing my own teachings to you, now I become a false teacher and I do not have any authority nor do you have any responsibility to follow the things that I say. I don't have authority. Paul, Paul did. Paul had that authority. You say, well, why did he have to flaunt it? I mean, Paul an apostle? I mean, is it like... People nowadays that love the credentials, and they have all these titles before and after their name. Why did he have to say he's an apostle? I think the answer is rather obvious when you understand the context of the letter. Paul had to be one who was heard. He had to tell these guys that my words to you are inspired. My words are the words of Jesus Christ. When I speak, I speak Scripture. Because this church, as I said, had an unrepentant minority. And this church had people, as all churches do, of false teachers that were seeking to undercut Paul's message. So who does the church listen to? Here's Paul. He's far away in Macedonia. And there's people right there in that very church saying, listen to us. Don't listen to Paul. Don't listen to Paul. Listen to us. So Paul writes a letter, and they're probably saying, well, Paul, you're saying this, and they're saying that. Who do we follow? you got to remember, they didn't have Bibles back then like we have today. Who do, we fo- who do we follow? And Paul says, you follow me because I'm an apostle. My weight and my teaching carries greater weight than the things the false teachers are telling you. I'm not bragging about a title. I want you to understand that my words represent Christ, that I've been commissioned by Jesus Christ for service, that I'm an apostle. Look at verse 1. 
of Jesus Christ, not by my own desire. I didn't appoint myself to this office, but I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And you look at Paul's conversion, it was nothing that he was seeking, was it? And you can imagine his, his opponents said, well, what makes him an apostle? Why does he have greater weight than us? And that's what this letter kind of gets at. Because they're attacking him. They're saying, well, Paul, if you're an apostle, why are you suffering so much? Sounds like today. If you're such a godly man and you're God's chosen instrument to be his apostle, why are you suffering so much, Paul? And Paul, where's all the dramatic miracles? This sounds like today. I mean, if you're an, if you're an apostle, you just would snap your fingers and you just wipe those false teachers out, kind of like Moses did. Why isn't that happening? And where are these letters of commendation? I mean, I'm not getting letters from other churches that say you're this great guy. And Paul, when you come, your, your, your personal impressive your personal appearance really isn't that impressive. As a matter of fact, your preaching is actually kind of dull. I mean, if you're an apostle, Paul, you'd be collecting money from us, and you keep refusing that money. And now you're collecting money for some collection in Jerusalem. How do I know where that money's going, Paul? It was attack, attack, attack on this guy. Interesting. Let's go to the recipients. Verse 1 still. Who got this letter? Who received it? To the church of God, which is at Corinth. That's why we get the name Corinthians. With all the saints who are throughout Achaia. So why don't you throw that uh, last the map back up again, guys. Thanks. Here's a small down scale of what we were looking at before. Um, you can see that uh, here's Macedonia. This is Upper Greece. This is Lower Greece. This is Achaia. And again, you can see Corinth is right there. You say, how many churches were in Achaia? Well, we don't, we don't really know. We don't know. Uh, the most prominent church was Corinth. We know that there's one church in Sencrea. That's spoken of in Romans chapter 16, I believe, verse 1, where, where Phoebe was. Uh, there might have been some other churches scattered around the landscape here, but the predominant church was here. So when Paul's writing from Macedonia, he's writing to the church in Corinth and any other little tiny church that might be scattered around this region. These churches just started. He just founded these churches. I mean, this is very beginning early Christianity. Um, city right here is Corinth. What's so significant about that city is, as I said, it was a port city. You can see there's a harbor right here where boats would come in and dock. And there's also a harbor down here, a gulf that boats would come in and dock right there. Um, oftentimes, you would try not to sail around the Peloponnesus. This was the Peloponnesus. That was about 250 miles. So if you came in here and the boats weren't as big back then as they are today, uh, they had a way to transport the boats across this little four-mile strip of land right here into the other side. So people were coming, people were going. A lot of money was exchanged. You can imagine, like any port city, it had all the, the lewd behavior that went with the city. You had the, 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 the sailors, the, the, the women, the prostitution, uh, the gambling. You had all kinds of religions because it's a port city coming in from all over the world, right? But this was the third most significant city in the entire Roman Empire. Back then when Paul wrote, there was about a half million people that were living in this area. In the center of the city was the temple to Epaphrodite. That was the goddess of love that was equipped with hundreds of priestesses, which were technically prostitutes. Uh, the term at the time, to Corinthianize, meant to, to sleep with a, a prostitute. So you had all kinds of immoral behavior, all kinds of lewd behavior, all kinds of religious pluralism going on back then. So again, when people say, boy, what's ever going to happen here at the Jersey Shore? When I study what happened back then, this is really nothing. This, we're pretty all well-behaved. I mean, Jersey Shore show, that's actually pretty well-behaved compared to what was going on back in Corinth. But notice that Paul didn't run from that. Where does he go? He runs to it, right? He runs to it. He runs to Corinth and says, by the grace of God, we're going to plant a church right here in Satan's domain. He spends about 18 months in the town on his second missionary journey, Acts 18, verse 11. And during that time, those 18 months he spends, he camps out, he plants the Lord's flag, and he starts a church there in Corinth on his second missionary journey. He's now writing to them, as you know, on his third missionary journey. That's good, guys. Thank you. Um, who does he write to in Corinth? Look at the recipients. It's the church of God. He's writing to the church of God. Now, in a um, formal sense... Um, I think you know that all of God's people are part of his church. When we see the word church used in the Bible, it's not always thinking of a, a physical location in a geographic place. Um, all people are part of God's church. We should all be involved in a, in, a, in a local church as we are here, which is a good thing. 
But the moment, you know this, when you get saved, the very second you get saved, God takes you from the world and baptizes you, it says in 1 Corinthians, into his church. So all people, if you are a true Christian, are in God's church. That's why we call that the invisible church. All Christians are in, they might not all be attending physical churches. There might be non-Christians attending physical churches. But in the eyes of God, the invisible church are all the people that love Christ, that are saved. I think you've heard me say it many times before that uh, the church is here, no doubt about it in that sense, because you are here. But the moment 1.30, 2 o'clock rolls around and all of us kind of go off to our homes and everything else, the church is gone. This is no longer a church. You know, the sign says it. We're not a church anymore. This is just a building. God doesn't dwell in this church like he dwelt in the Old Testament tabernacle. It's a building. Where does God dwell now? He dwells within his people. So when you leave in that sense, the Spirit of God goes with you, right? So God has people who love him on the Jersey Shore. Those are, that's his church. That's his church. And God had people who loved him in Corinth, and they were his church as well. But what Paul is getting at here, I think, is more of the lesser sense of what the church is. People that are not ashamed of Christ, that prioritize the Lord's day, and say we are going to identify ourselves with other Christians publicly. We're not just the invisible church. We're not going to stay hidden away. We're going to get together. We're going to assemble together in one location and be God's visible local church. In this case, in Allenwood, but then in the city of Corinth. We see nothing, beloved, of God's invisible church in the Bible not identified with a physical church. There are no freewheeling, Lone Ranger, Maverick Christians just floating around. What church do you go to? I worship at in the Mediterranean. You know, I worship on the shores of Crete. That's my church. That's where I meet with God. No. Yeah, there's a place of that, of course, but it, you don't see that. You see, people in the Bible always identified with a visible church. To hear God's word proclaimed, to praise his name, to serve each other, encourage each other, fellowship with each other, pray. You can't do this in front of a televangelist on the television uh, uh, set. To pray for one another, to hold each other accountable, to be involved in each other's lives, to bless each other, to be a visible light. If the church didn't gather together and we made ourselves known, how would people know who Jesus is? And the church in Corinth was doing the same. Jesus loves his church. Jesus purchased the church with his blood, Acts 20, 28. Jesus is the head of the church. And it's neat that when God chose a time to speak, he didn't do it very often, but when God chose a time to speak, who did he write this letter to? Was it people in ivory towers? Was it the world leaders of the day? He wrote the letter to the church. The church is a special place. We belong to a church. The church belongs not to a pastor. This is not my church. It's not a denominational church that we belong to a denomination. We belong to God. This is God's church, the church of God in Lake Como. We are simply carrying on a rich biblical legacy that started way back then in Asia Minor and Greece and Italy and, and uh, the Mediterranean, the, 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 the Middle East. That happened then that is continuing today. The church of God that is continuing to be blessed by God. Now, the people in the church, and this is interesting too, are identified with that word, you see it there? Saints. Paul's writing to the church, specifically who in the church? The saints in the church. Now, I wasn't, I was never Catholic. And I don't know much about the saints, so I'm a little dull in understanding this whole way of thinking. But I just want to be logical about this. Uh, The picture that many Christians have, and I'm sure there's some in here today, of what a saint is, is not the people that Paul was writing to. I'd have a hard time believing that those individuals that are, 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 are pulled out and selected by a church as you are a saint, you, most of you are not, but these individuals are saints, and these individuals need to be prayed to, and these individuals need to be esteemed more than other people. Um, I don't think those individuals were present in this immoral, dysfunctional church in Corinth in the first century. He wasn't writing to some super class group of individuals. He was writing to people just like you and I. He was writing to the people in the church, all people, the leaders, the non-leaders, everyone who was part of that church, Paul was writing to those people. So those people are the saints. 
What that means, and this might catch you by surprise, you're a saint. You're a saint. You might be saying, well, I know I'm a saint, but those guys in Corinth weren't saints. Have you read 1 Corinthians? They were far from saints, right? How can Paul call the people in Corinth a saint? I mean, they were one of the most problematic churches in the entire New Testament. Here's the answer. A saint ultimately is not found in what a person does practically, but who a person is positionally, the way they are seen in the eyes of God. Now, I admit that the moment we give our lives to Christ, there should be some practical change. I hope that if you gave your life to Christ 20 years ago, you are not the same person spiritually that you are now that you were back then. I want to believe that all of us in this church, if we are still together five years from now, are different then than we are today. That is called progressive sanctification. That is called being conformed to the image of Christ. That is spoken of in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. There is a need for maturity. There is a need for spiritual growth. But none of us ever arrive in that position of saintliness, if I can use that term. We're all growing, we're all maturing, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the fact that the split second you give your life to Christ positionally, you are a saint in the eyes of God. How's that? Because in the eyes of God, the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been accredited or imputed to your account. When God sees you, you've got to get this, folks, or else you're going to be discouraged in your Christian life. When God sees you, he does not see you for who you are right now so much as he sees you for who you are in Christ. The only reason you are accepted by God and your worship's pleasing to God this morning and that you can be confident that the very split second you die, as Paul would say, to be absent from the body is to be home immediately with the Lord is because you are a saint. We're not saved based on our works, are we? We don't teach that. We're saved based solely upon the grace of Jesus Christ, the unmerited favor that has been lavished upon our accounts because of not what we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. When you give your life to Christ, all of that is put in your account. And when God sees you in the courtroom of heaven, so to speak, he knocks down that gavel and says, not guilty, you are justified in my sight. Not because of what you have done, because I've taken all your sin, heaped it upon Christ, and taken all his righteousness and heaped it upon you. 2 Corinthians 5.21, right? He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become in him the righteousness of God. The great exchange took place. You're a saint because God has declared you to be a saint. And I hope you're in the business of being made a saint as well. So when Paul says saints, he's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to people that are not worthy of it, but have been declared worthy because of what Christ has done through his death and resurrection. Make sense? And then last, briefly here, in the introduction, we got the greeting. That was the third part of a letter of antiquity. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's what we enjoy because of the work of Christ. You say, what do we get? Well, let's just focus on the sin part because that's where we need to focus in a sense. Through Christ, we have the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. All of your sins have been washed away in the blood of Christ, even the ones you haven't committed yet if you're in Christ. You have the power, if you're in Christ, this is grace as well, to say no to sin and ungodliness and the ability through the power and grace of God to overcome sin. You don't have to be a slave to sin anymore, Romans 8 or 6. And you also have the wonderful promise upon you that you will be delivered one day from the eternal presence of sin. That when you die, sin is done, it's been dealt with, and you are enjoying peace with God forever in heaven apart from the presence of sin. That's grace. That's God's undeserved blessings that we have in Christ. These and many other things are tokens of God's grace. And we also have peace, it says. Uh, uh, Grace was more of a Christian greeting. Peace was more of the Jewish greeting. And peace is available for all believers because of God's grace. Because we have God's grace, we now have peace. It's a well-being that we enjoy in our hearts. And Paul's going to talk about that in this letter, that despite these awful circumstances, we can know with certainty that all is well between us and God. Even the world is crashing down around us as we sang in that third song, right? We can know that all is well between us and God. We can have peace reigning continually in our hearts. And you say, where do you get that kind of peace? Where do you get that kind of grace? That's a good question to ask. Well, look at the verse. We get it from the only place they could truly deliver, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only place, my friends, you're going to find it. Man, I find it so comforting 
I find it so comforting. We could read this letter. That this is just the introduction. This is, this is good, and it's just the introduction. That we can read a letter that was written to people that are thousands of miles away from us, living 2,000 years ago, and we can be blessed and benefit from it. Why? Because God spoke through the inspired apostle. And the way he spoke through that inspired apostle, he is still speaking to our hearts today when we read and study these words. And because God's people, you know what? We might look different. We might have different culture, different nationality. We might think a little differently. But at our core, we are still the same. And the things they struggle with are the same things we struggle with today. And the way God redeemed them is the way he is redeeming us today. He is the unchanging God. The word of God is unchanging. It transcends through time, and it cuts right to the quick at the issues that most affect our hearts. And that's why God, and I pray he does, uh, will minister to our hearts as we work our way through this wonderful letter of 2 Corinthians. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Just having the word of God before us is another token of the grace that you've given to your church, that you would love us, that you would set us apart from the world, that you'd speak specifically to your church, that the church, in a sense, would be the apple of your eye, that you'd send us leaders like the Apostle Paul that are just so willing to suffer and be abused for the sake of the church. Father, may we all have that sacrificial love for the body, just like you did in laying your life down when we didn't even ask you to do it. Father, thank you for giving us the grace that we can enjoy through Christ. We pray if there's someone here that does not know you, that right now that individual, Lord, would have his or her eyes opened, that, Lord, you remove that veil, and that you would draw that person to yourself, that they may embrace Jesus Christ, admitting that they are a sinner, and that apart from Christ's work on the cross, there'd be no hope of ever being reconciled with you because the sin remains, but that Jesus Christ took that sin upon himself, and through faith and repentance, we can receive the forgiveness that will always be ours. Thank you for such a simple gospel message, and thank you for such a wonderful life that we can have knowing that you guide us and that you love us and that you minister to us and that you're too content to leave us in our sin, but you discipline us and you challenge us as well, that we might partake in the glory that you have laid aside and prepared for us. Bless us now as we turn our attention to the table. Father, if there's someone here without Christ, pray that they allow these elements to pass by because this is representing communion, communion that we have with you because of the work of Christ. If someone has embraced Christ, I hope they pray and understand right now that at this very split second, they are a saint. They are a saint. They are part of your church. They are part of this church in that sense, and they are welcome to partake because, Lord, we are all leveled at this table. The only righteousness we have that's going to count for anything is the righteousness that has been accredited to our account. Thank you for blessing us and accepting us through the work of Christ and minister to our hearts now as we partake in the Lord's table as we are commanded. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.